no spit zone. <laughs> so if this is the no spit zone and you get spit on, then consider yourself being baptized. Okay? <laughs> Boy, it's it's just great to be here. I mean, just you guys are my family. You know, and, and you know, I have a sister. I um, I don't. You know, I I would get with her in, in a family setting. Sometimes I wouldn't do something that just not quite right, and um, she wouldn't say anything. And then I get later on with her, and she call me into a room and, and she said, you know, whatever I said or something like that wasn't quite right. So if I say something that's kind of off color or, or something like that, you know, just, just, you're my family, so just have to tolerate it. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, this is, this is an awesome, awesome time to be with the Lord here in this house. You know, um, when I was in high school, uh, believe it or not, I don't know if I told my wife or my my kid, but I used to play basketball a long time ago. I wasn't very good, but um, I went from the A team to the B team. I was really lousy, and then I got really better as I went on, but not really great. And um, uh, I realized that, you know, you get in the, the locker room, and, and you go be going up against somebody that's really difficult and tough, and, and um, it was a coach that would be you know, cheering us on and, you know, yelling at us and stuff like that. So, you know, isn't it a great day to be with the Lord? Amen. Let's get enthusiastic about it. All right. Okay. Well, today I'm going to speak. I'm going to open my Bible here. Get it together here. Um, on the grace of God. Amen. And the scripture is 2 Corinthians 12, 19. So let me go to 2 Corinthians 12, 19. I've got this all put out here. Um, I guess everybody's got it. Um, it says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in my weakness. Therefore, most that... The power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm going to kind of talk about the strength um, and the grace being sufficient. You know, what is grace? I looked it up in the um, dictionary and I'm going to kind of try to paraphrase it because some of the wording in it was pretty intensive for me to say so uh, what is grace grace is the blessing that is graciously bestowed now bestowed I looked up which was, I was quite impressed with you know it's kind of a weird word bestowed means something that is put on top of you you know it, it, it and, I, and I was thinking about the days of you know um, the knights and everything, when a knight becomes a knight, he, they take the sword and they knight him on both sides, you know. And I'm thinking, that's bestowing. They have authority and they're bestowing, you know, whatever it is. So, grace is the blessing that is graciously bestowed and is freely given without claim or merit. That means we have no right to have the grace that God gives us. Now, I'm going to tell you a story of my childhood. I'm sure I wonder where Carla is because she'll probably want to take notes. She wants to make out a book of my life story and make millions and give it to my wife. But anyway, I'm neither here nor there. When I was a young kid, I was probably nine or ten years old. I lived down in the Ozarks on. Um, um, Indian Point Road in Branson. And um, there was not very many people. I didn't have very many friends because there weren't very many people back there when I was a young kid. Now you can't even you know, go anywhere and there's somebody there. But one of the things that my grandfather, my grandma and grandpa, they raised me, and the one thing my grandfather had was he had a track. And I was a tractor fool. Let me tell you, I love my track. And I'd get on that tractor and I'd be all by myself and I'd just drive that tractor all over the place, up and down the hills and everything. 
One day, I got the bright idea, I don't know why, our property went on the edge of the lake, a rock lake. And so I thought, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see just how far I can drive that tractor into the lake before it gets stuck. <laughs> so I, 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 I drive it down there, put, 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 and it wouldn't move another, another end. I'm scratching my head and I'm thinking, geez, what am I going to do? I got the tractor stuck. It's in the way. It wasn't over the, um, the engine because it's a big tractor. But it was still in the way. And I'm thinking, geez, I'm going to have to go get Grandpa. So I go up the hill from the way, and my grandpa, he, you know, we, we own, or he owned a resort, and that's why I lived down there. And, and he, I remember going into the office, and he was always behind the, the office um, uh, desk and everything. And I said, Grandpa, and he said, yeah. I said, I got a problem. He said, yeah. And you gotta understand my grandpa. My grandpa was a godly man. He he had his problems, but I never, 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 never saw him get mad, say a curse word, or say anything bad about anybody. He was just a loving guy. And he said, you know, I, I said, I got the tractor stuck. Well, where do you got the tractor stuck? I said, well, it's in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> He looked at me and he said, what? I said, yeah, I drove the tractor in the And he said, why? And I looked at him and I said, I want to see how far I can go before it got stuck. And my grandpa, he back looked at me, did you get mad? Did nothing. He said, did you learn? I said, yeah. He said, okay, well, let's go. So he didn't say anything. We got in this. We had my grandpa had a big old huge Dodge station wagon. It was a big old thing. And Wing Eagle, the name of the resort on the side, you know. And, and I get in the side, and this was back in the old days where, you know, station wagons were really station wagons. They were big and huge, you know. So we go down there, drive down the road. You know, we backed up. I hook up the thing and everything, and. We pull it out of the lake, you know, he gets it out, and it's running, it's fine, it's everything, you know. You, you would think that he would walk up to you and say, Now, son, don't ever do that again. But my grandpa didn't do that. He got out of the, you know, station wagon, and hooked the strap, put it in the back, got back into the, the station wagon, and drove away. You know, and I'm thinking, I don't believe it, I didn't get yelled at. Now, that was my father. I would have gotten swished. I would have gotten yelled at. But my grandpa, he just jumped in the car. He drove away and left me down there with the track. <laughs> and I just took off and put, 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 put on, 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 on my way. That was the, you know, I was trying to give you the guys an idea of what real grace was. He had every right to jump my case, every right to get mad at me. Why he did, the only thing I can think is the Lord told him, or his, his spirit told him, it's all right, it's cool. Nobody got hurt, nothing was damaged. It was just an experience I had to learn not to do it again. <laughs> Needless to say, I never did it again. But sometimes, you know, sometimes things like that happen. Um, and sometimes we have many different kinds of grace, you know, when, when, when God gave me this word and he said, you need to preach on grace. And I thought, okay, why? Why do I need to talk to people? I mean, I'm thinking grace being, well, when you get saved, that's when you receive grace. But grace can mean many different things. You know, I mean, one thing, but it's the unbelievable grace that God gives us to either handle the situation in which we have right now, or handle the situations that we're going to. I'm going to do the demonstration right now, an illustration. If Emma will come up here, I've asked her to be my guinea pig. And she said, okay. Now I'm going to pretend 
that I am God. Okay? And she's got a problem that is coming up. Let's come this way a little bit. We got this problem. She got this problem that she's dealing with and everything. So she grabs my hand and she takes. She takes. We're going that way. Okay, I'll grab that hand. <laughs> so she's going that way with it. She's taking this problem and she's going that way. And we're moving it on and everything. Okay, hold on. Okay, that's what a lot of people think. God behind you, you're dealing with the problem. That's not always right. Come on, not this way. God takes His grace and He says, I'm going to go before you with this problem, and we're going to go and deal with the problem, whatever the problem is, and we're going to win because I am with you. Amen. Thank you, Emma. Amen. Amen. So, that's another form of grace. Sometimes, when you have, when um, you got grace, and you, you're dealing with a circumstance. I'm telling another story, and I'm sure I'm not going to get the dates and times right, so forgive me in this, but after me and Tina were married, we had Matthew, and then we were lucky and we had Luke. You know, sometimes we are oblivious and we don't totally know we're walking into circumstances. Mm -hmm. But God knows. He's there. He's following us. He, you know. My youngest son, one time, he's sort of like me. I'm a bit embarrassed to that. He's sort of like me. He's kind of clumsy sometimes. And he, and he walked into a door and bumped his head. You know. So his head got kind of big and everything. Um, you know, I didn't think too much of it and everything. And Tina, this baby, two days along the way, Tina comes up to me and says, man, look at that big bump on his head. And so I said, man, we need to take it in. I've learned on the fire department that when something does not change within a 24-hour period of time, you need to go have it looked at. Of course, you know, I'm always instantly wanting to go to the hospital for everything. It drives me crazy. If I get sick or I have pain, I want to go to the hospital. So, I took, we took Luke in and they did an x-ray on it. And, you know, I wasn't expecting anything from what I found out. She come, the doctor comes back in and he says, I said, well, what's going on with the, 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 in the bump? Did he have a concussion or something? And, and the doctor said, no, 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 he didn't have a concussion, but we're concerned. And I said, why? He said, um, with the x-ray, we're seeing something we want to check into a little bit more. I said, what? He said, well, we can't really tell right now, but we want to schedule you to go have another x-ray. So, I, you know, we said, fine. So we go in, and they x-ray him a little bit more, and they come back, and he says, the doctor says, um, we, want, we want you to go over to a neuro, I get what they call it, neuro, what, what is it? Neurologist. Yeah, neurologist. So we went over to, and, and, and I worked over at the hospital at the time, and I knew the neurologist, and, and he was kind of a different guy. That's all I had to say. <laughs> different guy. I liked him, he was fine, but he was just a different guy. And we went in there and everything. He said, you know, we think your son has an arachnoid cyst. And I'm thinking, what is an arachnoid cyst? You have in your brain and in your head, you have different layers. And within those layers and between those layers, sometimes some people are born with a cyst. And a lot of people don't even know that you have it. But the problem is, if you do not get that cyst taken care of, it can rupture and you can have meningitis. You can die. You know, and so they said, what we want you to do is we want to take your son to um, Carl Clinic. So then we went to Carl Clinic, they, they confirmed this, and then they said, we want, you to go, we want you to go up to a specialist up in St. Louis to Barnes, um, hospital. So we went up there to one of the greatest, you know, 
nurse surgeons up there. And he said, yeah, your son's got an arachnoid cyst. You know, and all this time you're thinking, all he had was a bump on the head. And this has turned into a nightmare. A total nightmare. And I can remember, they said, we're going to have to go in. But we're not going to go in now. We want to keep an eye on it. We're going to give you 12 months to go home and act like nothing's wrong to deal with it and try to understand it and find God. They didn't say that, but that's what ended up happening. I'm telling you, for 12 months, it was hell for me. Because I worried about my son. Because they said, if that thing busts, and it could any time, you know, you'll have liquid that comes out, you need to get to your doctor, to your doctor immediately. So we went through 12, and I remember, I was working at CHI at the time, I remember, you know, I drove a, um, a sleeper. I remember one night, I was really depressed. I was really frustrated. And I was wondering, you know, where is God? Why does my son have to go through this? And it was tough. And I almost cried. And I said, I can't handle this. I was worried about my son. And I had to be the man. I had to keep my feelings inside. I felt like I did. I had to keep my feelings inside and be the man to run the family and act like I had it all together. But actually, I was frustrated. I was feeling bad. God gave me this scripture. He said, My grace is sufficient enough for you. Mm. Take it and run. And at that point in time, I was able to accept whatever happened. I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. But I knew God was involved in it. And when God is involved in it, I can handle anything. Amen. Amen. So he went ahead and had the operation. I, I don't know if he'll remember this, but I remember one thing. This was back when my son thought I was the greatest man in the world, the greatest dad. I remember we prayed for him before he went in. We were in there, and he rolled it in. I said, are you ready for this, son? And he said, Lock and load. And I thought, man, that was great. My son did not worry about this. He had he, he was ready for it, it was fine. Whatever was going on, and he went in, he came out. Then he wanted to play football right after. Well, he couldn't play football for a while. But but the thing is now you can't you wouldn't even have known that he had that problem. That was an example in my life where God took my hand. And he let me know that there was a problem and was able to go before. So those, that's another time that, that you know, you got those two, two types of grace. Then you've got another scripture I want to give you, um, excuse me, is Ephesians 6.13. When you've done everything, and you've done it all, and you said, God, I can't go no farther, and you've done it all, then you just stand. <coughs> you stand Amen. in the Amen. belief that God's there and is going to help you out. I think it's harder to go and feel like, I don't know how people do it when they're not got God with them. To go through life and believe you got it all under control. And of course with me, as clumsy, as unsure as I am, I didn't you know, I just threw some major stuff up along the way. It's like yesterday. We went out to eat, you know, and um, I, we did. We went out to eat. And I'm sitting here, and, and Bob and Stacy came along. We all went out and did some shooting and everything. And Bob and Stacy were looking at us, and Carla was next to me, or Doug was next to me, and everything. And I was just telling them, I was, God has told me to, wit to witness and to preach to you guys today, so I, I really feel that this is absolutely awesome for me. But I was so happy that God, that, that um, uh, Doug, that Doug said, yeah, you can, if you think you can handle it, you go ahead. And I was so happy that the late, the person that was next to me that had a bunch of chips, you know what I did? I said, like that. <laughs> the chips went everywhere. <laughs> You know, I mean, so I mean, and, and I did the same thing with one of the speakers we had that was out there, and I, I was just being me, and I'm big, 
I'm forward, I'm boisterous, and it's just what I am. But anyway, again, yeah, either you love me or you don't love me. <laughs> if we're all family guys, you gotta deal we with love this you, and be happy. <laughs> well, you know, we love you, Paul. I'm glad somebody does. <laughs> it's a good time in the house of the Lord. Amen. Even when you gotta go, you'll like me doing the sermon. Um, so, moving on. Um, we need to stand. You know, I think I am so awesome. It's so awesome to to to, to have this church. I mean, we started in Doug's front room. Mm. We started. A bunch of people got together and we said we need to have church. And I said, Doug, get on it. Be the pastor. Let's do it. <laughs> and he feels farted around a little bit. He finally <laughs> said, okay, fine. After about six months, God told him he's got to have this church. So, so it was good. So we started the church in his house. It was awesome. Just that little church. You know, we had to pray the Lord. Then we moved over there to uh, Mount Zion, um, other place over in there. And we went from that spot. And I watched this church start from a few little people to what it is now. Mm. And it's awesome. Amen. It is awesome that we've taken... What we've got from God, God has led us, grabbed a hold of us with His grace, mm. and led us through the amen, fire. Amen. And we're here now. Amen. We're in this building. This is only temporary. temporary. It's no That's big right. deal. And it doesn't have to be super great. Mm. We've got this great place right now. Amen. We've got to thank God for what we got. There's some people out there that go to church on wood floors. And we've got a concrete floor. <laughs> you know, it's good. Amen. It's not bad. Amen. We've got, we're not out in the cold. Mm -hmm. We've got a heater that works. Yeah. I mean, if you think where God has taken the spirit of life, it's just miraculous that He's taken us where we are. Amen. You know, and we're going farther. Amen. There's going to be a church over in that area. I don't like tennis, and we don't need tennis. <laughs> so I know we're going to have one over there. It's going to be neat. You know? And we've got to believe that. Amen. God has told me, this is where I want you. And when God tells me something, I, I can remember another time, when, when we were first married, uh, I wanted to buy a house. And... We couldn't afford a house at the time, so we bought Doug's and Carla's mobile home at the time. And I decided that I wanted to move into a house. And everybody back then said, oh, you can't sell a trailer. It's impossible. And I said, I prayed about it. God said, you get ready. You get your stuff in line, and you're going to sell your, your truck. And so I did, and of course everybody else was saying that I knew, oh, you can't sell it, it's going to be, and God said, go. When God says go to me, mm. he means go. Amen. Bar the doors and look out, here we go. <laughs> so I, I, I get things going, I turn around, I put it in, and, and a lady walks up. This is no lie. I don't think we had to sign out more than a day. Lady walks up and says, I want this trailer, I'll pay you cash. Wow. Said okay, that's fine. <laughs> Let's do it. He, he gave me, I sold it. I gave, and then we had the money to go and put it on the other house that we lived over off of Weaver. Mm. That's where my other two boys were born. Well, they weren't born there. They were born in the hospital. That's where I raised them for the first part of their, their life. You know, and then God says it's time to move again. Mm. Every time. That I, in my life, every time I've had to make a change, I've always had to go to God. I can't afford to just throw out money. I've found my times to have the most, when grace has been disposed, disposed, bestowed on me the most, is when I do not deserve it, and when I, have, when I see there's no other way to do it. That's good. God miraculously jumps in and does his thing, and whatever it is, it always works. Amen. I think also God will give you grace when you think you can't handle something. We need to, as a church, in our Christian community, we need to put on our big boy pants. When God gave me that word, I said to him, God, 
<laughs> already wearing a 40 waist, how much bigger are you talking? And he says, just do it. So I'm saying, you know, we as Christians need to put on our big boy or big women pants, whatever they may be. We need to get in the saddle and do God's word. Amen. And it's hard sometimes because we got the dead of the world out there and they're telling you, you can't do it. You're, you don't have what it takes. When I first got saved, I did not know how to read. Mm. I was one of the few people back in the 80s. I was graduated in 81. I was one of the few people in this world probably that went through high school with a diploma that could not read more than a second grade education problem. Is that? Mm. And when I got saved, and God came and, and gave me the Holy Spirit, He said, "I will teach you to read." Amen. He said, "All you need is the Bible." And so I started reading the Bible. I went to Bible studies. I had a mentor that mentored me and said, "This is what it says. This is why it says it." I learned to read the Bible. I mean, and. and and, it, you know, I was reading to learn the V's and thousand and don'ts. It's not like today it's a little bit easier now. You know, I still have a problem with sometimes I want to put together the, uh, I don't always put the periods in the right spot. But we can, I'll confess to that. And I was over there at the um, Bible study and I tried to give a, a reading on um, Noah. That was something else. But, Neither here nor there. I think it's time. Now I want to get you guys out of here before the band is full. Uh, um, it is time for us people to really put on the big boy pants. And I really enjoyed having the opportunity to talk to you, and I hope that this has been an encouragement for you. That's Amen. what I wanted it to be. Amen. That's what God told me. Excuse me. He said there's some, there's enough things out there in this world right now. I mean, you guys got to, I mean, we, he was saying to me, he said, we got to get out there and get ready because the time is coming soon. There's a love for getting my failures. There's a hole that's setting me free. There's a light defeating my darkness. There's redemption calling and causing all to sing. Father, will you come and open up our eyes? Sing.